Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to this talk. Thank you so much for everyone tuning in to watch and thank you to Robert for coming to talk to us today. Robert Fiberg is the president of Clark Belt Space, a company which he founded in 2004. In this role, he is responsible for broad advisory and strategic consulting roles to the global commercial space industry. Robert has developed successful business analyses and plans for multiple clients active in the GEO and LEO regimes, including MDA Corporation for their OneWeb Constellation work, Space Systems Laurel for their on-orbit robotic servicing business, Swiss Space Systems for their reusable air launch spacecraft development, Swedish Space Corporation for their new business segment strategies in the fast-growing LEO data analytics markets and multiple others. Mr. Feiberg, as a well-recognized space industry expert, has an impressive track record in the groundbreaking satellite technologies and services around the world. During the past 25 years, he held the CEO, CCO and VP leadership positions at EcoStar in the Netherlands, SES in Luxembourg, various useful SAP partnerships in France, Italy and the USA, Hughes Network Systems International Division and SpaceX, the California-based private rocket company. Mr. Fireback also leads the commercial launch of the world's first KA band sport theme high throughput satellite HTS for youthful sat. Mr. Fireback holds a bachelor's degree in computer science applications from the University of Utah and an MBA from the Thunderbird School of, Man of Global Management. Robert also speaks seven languages fluently. Um, so I'll pass over to you to do a talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Well, today's talk, um, I wanted to just give a, a little bit of an overview, a uh, very, very brief overview of where our industry is uh, today, what what elements we're seeing in today's uh, uh, what we call new space industry. Uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, we touch upon not the old stuff that we've been doing for 50, 60 years, but the things that are happening today and the things that are happening from now into the future. There's a lot of activity happening. So I'd like to just touch upon that particular uh, subject. And then I'd like to give you guys a thought about where it is all this is leading towards, because there's a finality to everything that's happening in space right now, all the um, tremendous amount of activity. And, uh, and there's a, a place that is leading us towards, and that's what I'd like to leave your final thoughts on in terms of what impact it will have to, to us here on Earth. So let's start the, this presentation. If you can put it in presentation mode, um, I think uh, we can go with that and you can uh, change the slides for me or do we just keep it that way? I think you put it in presentation mode, right? It's bottom right. Uh, yep, next one over, right there. That should do it right there, yeah? Or else we'll just do it this way if you like. Uh, that's fine with me. Okay, let's proceed, just in the interest of time. Um, so I'm, a, I'm the founder of uh, Clark Belt uh, Space. Uh, it is a, a boutique consultancy firm that has, as uh, the kind words of introduction um, uh, mentioned, I've done a lot of different things in the space industry, everything from video services to data services, to launch, to on-orbit servicing, and data data analytics services as well. So uh, as I, I've been very, very fortunate to have a career that has allowed me to thrive and allowed me to be a, a strong participant in the space industry over multiple stages of its development over the past 30 years or so. and. I, I see right now the inflection point where we are today in the industry to be a tremendous, tremendous uh, passerelle into what's going on into the future as well. And that's what I'd like to concentrate on today, just to kind of speak a little bit about where we're going and so forth. So if you can, uh, yeah, if you just, just put it to the next slide, if you don't mind. So I'd like to say the new space and it's a new space, in fact, is very, very cool today because a lot of things are happening that are new. 
A lot of new players are involved in this industry today that were not involved in the industry 20 years ago or even 15 years ago. And there's a lot of new money coming in to fund this industry as well. So there's a very, real, real strong coolness to what's happening today. Thanks, uh, uh, obviously, to in part to, to people like Elon Musk, my former boss, who, uh, who you know, promised to build launch vehicles that would land one day. And when we were we were out uh, prospecting customers years ago, uh, a lot of our uh, a lot of the strong rocket providers back then uh, would uh, call us cowboys, American cowboys, because you guys will never do it. You'll never land a rocket. No one does that. So lo and behold, just about every single mission now that SpaceX launches, they land the booster back on Earth, and reusability is a reality, and that's really dramatically changed the economics of access to space in terms of cost per kilogram, cost for the missions to put up things in space. When you use a, a, an aircraft over and over again, that's how you can monetize an aircraft for traveling people from point to point. That's where we're getting now with these kind of vehicles where you can start reusing them for multiple missions, uh, five, six, seven, eight, even 10 times, uh, such that now you can lower the cost further and further of access to space. Lowering the cost of access, access to space gives you the economics to be able to th do things you couldn't do before because it was too expensive to launch uh, your payloads or your experiments or your or your technology into space. And that's a big game changer for the industry. So that's uh, one very, very cool thing that's happening today. You look at uh, Blue Origin on the top left. Blue Origin has also uh, been very quietly, they're not as noisy as, as SpaceX, but very quietly developing all kinds of technologies for access to space, both for the human space flight and for delivery of cargo and, and infrastructure into, into Earth and the moon and so forth. They're part of a project that is actually doing a, a lunar lander as well. So a lot of very, very, very cool things happening with Blue Origin. Uh, Jeff Bezos, as you know, just stepped out of his role at Amazon. Uh, and one of the things he clearly said there was that he wants to concentrate on some of his other ventures, including Blue Origin. And that means that you're going to put even more emphasis on making sure that human, uh, the humankind uh, can not only travel economically, but also thrive and exist in, in outer space. We've seen Virgin Galactic now active for nearly two decades. Uh, they've, take, they've taken the long road to design everything and build everything themselves and, and so forth. Uh, but we're getting now to an inflection point where we finally will see them performing these flights. And it's not just, uh, we'll talk a little bit later in the presentation, or it's not just about traveling and taking tourists, very, very high paying tourists to space. There's a lot more to it. And there's a reason why Virgin Galactic now in its evaluation in the stock market is doing uh, very, very well, relatively well, because of the future leaning things that they were planning on doing and not the things they're just they're planning on doing right now, but things they're planning on doing 10 and 20 years from now. And that involves high speed travel. And then on the bottom right, you see what looks like a few small satellites. And in fact, our industry today is being absolutely inundated with companies worldwide. There are a couple, a couple hundred companies worldwide that are producing and manufacturing components or sat, small satellites themselves. And these are satellites that now you can launch uh, for very, very low, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars manufacturing and hundreds of thousands of dollars for the launch. So. For under a million dollars, you can launch a small, small satellite, where before it would cost you 250 or 400 million dollars to launch a satellite, a big one. These small satellites now are allowing you to fly information, and by flying information in low Earth orbit, it allows you to create some very, very cool services and very cool analytics involving imagery, involving sensors for radar, involving uh, uh, looking through clouds and getting analytics out of that, uh, and the services are basically unlimited right now that are being created uh, with software and analytics linked to these uh, low, fly, low Earth orbit flying satellites that are very, very inexpensive to launch. And what you do today is you don't launch these satellites for a 15 year mission, you launch these satellites for a three or four year mission, and then you replenish them and launch new ones and new ones and new ones. Uh, so it's changed really the game in terms of how you think about launching uh, designing a satellite that's supposed to launch in the uh, tremendous uh, radiation from uh, from the from the sun for 15 years, 
It allows you to put the iPhone type of technology onto phones without having to test its radiation shielding for multiple, multiple years. And it allows you to innovate very, very quickly. So the industry is really, really going through a big, big change in the way things are done. So with that introduction, let's talk a little bit about the space economy. The next slide, please. So today, the space economy is roughly $360 billion today, right? And we're talking about uh, everything from, you know, the satellite manufacturing side, consumer equipment, uh, the launch industry, uh, the government services, and so forth. So it's a fairly large industry. Obviously, it's not as large as the telecom industry worldwide, but it's a fairly large industry that involves hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. One of the things that's happening today, which is very, very, uh, very exciting for me uh, as, as a person that's lived in this industry all, you know, all, all my career, is to see that our industry now is growing at a tremendous pace that it never has in the past. And by all means, uh, by all uh, analyses, uh, there's a certainty that this industry, industry will exceed a $1 trillion industry in the next 10 to 20 years. If you look, listen to Morgan Stanley, they say $1 trillion. If you listen to the United States Chamber of Commerce, they estimate that to be $1.5 trillion. If you listen to analysts like uh, Bank of America, um, the industry uh, is promises to go to three trillion. So by all by all accounts, you're looking at a, pl a one plus trillion dollar industry in the next ten to twenty years. That's tremendous growth. I mean, few industries are growing that quickly, other than telecoms have, of course, with five G and six G. But the space industry right now is at a very very crucial inflection point where things are happening that are just absolutely amazing in terms of technology, in terms of innovation, and in terms of services. And uh, I. Um, I am very, very lucky to be uh, part of this industry and to be able to talk about it in the way I do, uh, having lived, uh, you know, the early days of doing things in the hard way and, and doing now things in a very more innovative and, and low cost way that just excites me uh, uh, beyond, beyond belief. So let's talk now about some of the uh, latest transactions that have taken place over the past few years. Uh, that kind of illustrated a little bit the direction of some of these things that, that we're talking about uh, in terms of the growth to $1 trillion economy. Next slide, please. So if you look at some uh, major recent space transactions, you see some logos here. You may know them all. You may not know them all. But we'll talk a little bit about each one of these right now to just kind of give you an idea of what's happening. Uh, press enter, please. Virgin Galactic. Uh, as you know, a couple of years ago, they did a, a special purpose acquisition, uh, which is a reverse uh, IPO. Uh, they raised $650 million uh, through that SPAC. Uh, really, where the company is going, and I mentioned this earlier today, uh, is not just the transport of, of high-paying tourists. There's, they're developing technologies so that they can develop a high-speed transportation infrastructure. And that is the reason why their stock is doing so well today. The marketplace today is looking at Virgin Galactic not for the billionaire travel industry, because that's obviously is going to pay their bills initially, but it's looking at them for what they will do in the future, for point-to-point -point uh, Earth travel at high speeds. And that's why their stock has done very, very well since launch a couple of years ago, or a year and a half ago or so. Enter. Let's talk about relativity. They just very, very recently raised a half a billion dollar uh, raise uh, through some uh, uh, investment uh, partners. Uh, it isn't because they're building a 3D printed rocket to launch to space. There, are, as we talked earlier today, there are quite a few rocket launch companies, and if you, in fact, if you look worldwide, there are about a hundred companies developing small rocket launch vehicles today. Not all of them will make it. It's very expensive. It's very hard. Uh, it takes a long time to get yourself uh, to something that's operational that you can repeat and repeat and repeat. So you ask yourself the question, why? Why is relativity uh, valued now at, in the billion dollars or in dollar ranges for a company that still hasn't launched anything to space? Well, if you look at it closer, they are developing a 3D launched rocket. The whole rocket is, is printed by 3D technology, very large machines obviously, to build these big structures. But it's not the fact that they're building a rocket to launch to space. 
is the fact that developing technologies that allow you to use elements and ingredients to print not only the 3D rockets, but to be able to print structures in space, on the moon, in Mars, et cetera. One of the key things that you will need to do, to do whether we, we travel and we start inhabiting the moon or whether we start actually populating someday in our, in our near future uh, and walking on, on Mars is to build structures there. You can't take everything with you. It's too expensive to take uh, multi-billion dollar missions and it takes too long as well to do that if you have to bring all the raw materials with you. So what Relativity has, is doing and the reason why they have such a, such a good valuation today is because they're developing technologies that will allow you in situ to manufacture structures. And that is a big, that's also a big capability that is needed whether you're in the moon or in Mars or any, or any other rock by, by, by that matter, right? Let's look at the uh, Momentus. If you can press enter. Momentus uh, is another very, very recent uh, special purpose acquisition, a SPAC. They raised $175 million, which valued their company, I believe, at $2.1 billion um, with that raise. Last mile on orbit delivery of spacecraft. What does that mean? Well, we spoke about the fact that, you know, uh, with reusability, companies like SpaceX are able now to carry. Uh, payloads to space at a much, much lower price per kilogram. In fact, they're doing ride shares now for satellites. Every time they launch a Starlink batch of, of satellites, they will allocate a certain amount of payload um, uh, to launch a whole bunch of small satellites along with them. And by doing that, they dramatically lower the price per kilogram for those passengers to access space. So what happens when they drop off all those satellites alongside their satellites? Well, those satellites are not in the optimal position or in the optimal place they want to be because they rode together with a space a Starlink mission, right? So somehow those satellites need now to orbit raise themselves or position themselves into the uh, destinations that they want to be. And for that, there are several companies today that have risen to be able to provide that service. So they will go on that ride share, on that SpaceX ride share with their Starlink satellites. They will have a whole bunch of small satellites in this little uh, vehicle that has thrusters. And with those thrusters, this vehicle will actually uh, act as a space tug to move those satellites into desired orbits where they want to be. If you look at what that means for the industry, again, another game changer and another reason why Momentus is very successful right now in positioning itself and for the future of the space industry is because they are allowing you to be able to do on-orbit uh, maneuvers, on-orbit servicing, on-orbit uh, transfer. And that's another key element also. When you're in space, it takes a lot of energy to move from one place to another. And you're, you can't necessarily build that into your satellite itself because it will cost you extra. It will cost you extra payload, uh, extra, um, uh, extra mass, and mass translates into cost. So this company is being sort of a... Um, like a like a minibus that will take you from where your taxi dropped you off, and then the minibus will say, "Okay, now I'll take a few of those passengers that want to go somewhere else and take them to a final destination." Right. So another very innovative company, uh, and uh, a lot of smart people that are creating some great products as well. If you press enter, let's talk about the very very recent one, Astra, Astra Astra Space, company based in California. Um, they were under the radar as a, as a stealth company for, for about close to five years, I believe, either four or five years. And about a year ago or so, they exited from their stealth um, sort of umbrella and indicated that they're going to be launching a rocket very, very soon out of Alaska. Uh, the company was below the radar because they wanted to develop something very, very novel, a novel way of building small rockets uh, using sort of the automotive industry manufacturing technology, right? Uh, not trying to invent everything from scratch, but using processes that are used for low cost, basically vehicles. Vehicles in comparison to rockets cost very, very little, of course, you know? So using that kind of technology, building expendable rockets, because they're very, very small, but allowing you to take your, your, your mass or your rocket or, or your satellite 
to the destination you want to go at an extremely low price to the destination you want to go directly. So they've now launched their third rocket out of Alaska. The third one did make it to space. It did not have any payload that it delivered for the customers, but it did make it to space. To, I think it was 350 kilometers uh, altitude. So this company um, now has uh, done a SPAC of $500 million, uh, and they've also done a, a um, $200 million um, private investment um, through an equity company that also uh, get, adds another $200 million to their war chest. So very well financed, as you can see, and with the idea that lowering costs to, to bring things into space and into and to the desired destinations really has an attractiveness in the marketplace. So just to show you a few of the things that are happening, there's a lot of money, as you can see, that's going into the industry today. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are going to be translated into some amazing infrastructures, amazing habitats, amazing uh, technologies, and, and amazing uh, um, results from that for us here on Earth. So I'd like to speak about some of those results, or one of those results for, for, here, for, for us here on Earth, uh, what that will uh, mean for us. So if you change to the next slide. So what is the space industry? All these things we're talking about are great. And, you know, some people will be uh, will be in the moon and, and eventually some of you or or some of us maybe will be doing some things on Mars uh, and maybe a few other rocks around there. That's great. That's wonderful. And I think if you listen to Elon Musk and you listen to a few people like uh, Jeff Bezos as well, I think they're true, true believers that we must do something outside of our Earth just to preserve humanity. Because we've seen that we know of that we can estimate maybe four or five extinction events on Earth that uh, completely eradicated life on Earth. This will happen again at some point. We don't know if it's 200,000 years from now or a million years from now or even 20,000 years from now. But something will happen where a big rock comes back in and then we go back into Armageddon. Uh, so there's a, there is not a, it's not really a, a, a joke. It is a true belief that we, meet, we must be able to inhabit and survive as a humankind somewhere else outside of the earth to be able to preserve our, our humanity. And so that's what's, what's, what's driving some, a lot of these uh, innovations today. But, so let's look at the space industry in terms of high-speed travel. What's happening there? If you look at, for example, today and in the bottom, bottom end, there is, uh, you know, we travel with air, air, aircraft everywhere. And for about, uh, you know, $5,000 or so today, you can take zero gravity flights on specially modified aircraft to give you the, sen the sense of, uh, of um, uh, you know, zero gravity. The next step for that is, of course, uh, the uh, suborbital flights that uh, Virgin Galactic will be offering to billionaires uh, that are willing to pay a quarter billion dollar, quarter million dollars uh, per flight. Um, and the next step from that is, of course, is the recently announced trips to the ISS that are being uh, uh, done both by the Soyuz aircraft and by SpaceX with the Dragon aircraft. So as you go higher and higher, you're going to have flights to the moon for $150 million a piece or somewhere in that range. Uh, there's already a passenger that wants to do that, that has contracted the, the Dragon to do that. Uh, there'll be landings on the moon, and there'll be habitats on the moon, and so forth and so on. And obviously, the, the more complex the mission, the higher price you'll pay for that, right? Now, looking at the right-hand side, though, we're looking at some developments in the industry that are, uh, that are currently today a huge huge part of the focus uh, in the space industry. And that's long haul travel. As you know, you may have taken some airplanes from let's say San Francisco to Japan. That's a 14 hour flight. I've taken those, those flights many times. It's a long, long flight to, to Australia or to Japan from the West Coast of the United States. You lose a lot of time. Typically you lose three to four days round trip if, when you're going and coming back from your destination. So the next generation supersonic aircrafts are coming up. Uh, in the forefront, we'll talk about a few of them in a minute. Uh, but that is allowing us to now go back again to the to the point where we could travel at a higher speed, albeit not at uh, orbital speeds, but at speeds of Mach 2, Mach 3, perhaps a little bit more, um, to be able to shorten the time to travel from point to point. And that's a big market, and there's a, there are a few companies that are really concentrating on that market. Uh, the idea is that the price has to be a business trip price to be able to make it make it uh, conceivable. 
So these, uh, these companies are building smaller form factor aircraft that will allow you to carry 20, 30 people or so uh, per aircraft, not hundreds. And then if you go to the right-hand side, you see, uh, press again. Uh, sorry, once more. Then you have the hypersonic and orbital point-to-point -point travel. Okay? So that part of the marketplace is obviously very, uh, very complex, but doable today. The technologies that we are developing today allow us now to do much better technical rendering of capabilities with uh, computer graphics and computer uh, rendered uh, designs to allow us to see how a vehicle will act in hypersonic modes when you're talking Mach 5, Mach 8, Mach 9 through the atmosphere to allow us to design better, better skins on the vehicles, uh, um, allow us to also envisage carrying not only cargo but people across point to point in the United States at much, much higher speeds but still within the, 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 the um, atmosphere, right? And then you have the other side, which is, well, if you do that, why have all the complexity of flying through atmosphere and the heating that happens to your, to your frame that you have to sustain for you know, a few hours as you're traveling at hypersonic speeds? Why not just go to, to orbit and land on the other side? When you come back, you have a few minutes of uh, contact with the with the uh, at, at very very high speeds, of course, with the atmosphere. But perhaps that's another way to do it. And there are companies that are that are coming exactly to that particular uh, part of the industry. So next slide, please. So as we see the evolution of high speed global travel, and again, this is just one example of where the industry is going, and why the space industry is is driving these technologies. You see the commercial airliners today takes about, you know, a, a New York City to London flight takes about seven to eight hours, depending on what direction you're flying, right? Commercial airliners. The Concorde used to be able to provide that to you for about three and a half hours. I flew it one time. Uh, the next generation supersonic uh, vehicles, we would allow you to, to shorten those uh, times by even further to perhaps an hour and a half to two hours. Space transport could change the game by allowing you to, to, to travel from one end to the other of the Earth in less than an hour. And that's a game changer. When you, when you look at that, to be able to do that and come back for dinner again to your home after being at the other side of the world for, for, for a business lunch or dinner is game changing. It's absolutely game changing. So let's look at a few of the companies that are involved here. You can press enter. One of them is Boone Aerospace, you may have heard. Boom is, is, is a US company, uh, very well funded. They already have the mock-up vehicle that is going to be uh, flying very soon. Um, it's a test article, it's a smaller shape, but ultimately they, they'll, it'll be a big, uh, sort of a business class or business um, size vehicle that will be traveling at, at high speeds as well, led by a very, very uh, charismatic and very smart leader as well. Then the next one, click. Ariane Supersonic, another company. They just announced that they're putting their base in the Space Coast in uh, close to Cape Kennedy. Uh, that's where the factory will be. They're build, building also a supersonic airliner. Again, business jet form factor, which allows you to, uh, uh, to travel high speeds for business price, business uh, trip price, right? Then we have a few others. You click again, you see Virgin Mach 3. This is one of the... One of the pitches that Virgin Galactic is now uh, presenting of uh, being able to also invest in and develop a vehicle that will allow you to go supersonic speeds, but at Mach 3, not Mach one and a half or two, but Mach 3. So that's, uh, again, development time and, and, uh, and uh, funding needed to get there, but they've announced that they are also in this game. And then one more company that is announced is Spike Aerospace, another company again, developing a very, very, very uh, thin vehicle uh, that will be, uh, uh, you know, at some point, uh, taking passengers from one point to another at high speeds in the supersonic regime. So if we look at the uh, space transport category, there's one that's announced so far, and that's uh, the Starship from SpaceX. 
In the space transfer category, that is when things can really, really change, as I mentioned, in terms of time to access. Uh, you can lower your, tra the, your, your time to transport from one point to the other in less than an hour of to the opposite side of the Earth. Uh, but it also allows you to carry cargo from one point to the other of the Earth uh, for tons and tons of cargo. So there are a couple of markets that are coming out of there, not only for, uh, in this case, the, the Starship would be able to carry 100 passengers from one point to the other of Earth. Uh, obviously, this has to be regulated, and the regulators will be very, very concerned about where it lands, and it ostensibly will be landing in offshore platforms so that you're not, uh, you know, are presenting any kind of danger to uh, to to people and uh, and cities and so forth. But this has been demonstrated already with the with the SpaceX, uh, you know, uh, the Falcon 9 launches. So it's not a far uh, a far thing to imagine that Starship will eventually start flying on a, on a regular cadence. And we'll start demonstrating that it can be manageable and they can land it properly and so forth. The last two crash, but uh, they're developing so fast these vehicles, and and that you can you can see this happening in the next 10 to 20 years as being something that will be approved and regulators will be comfortable with to allow a spaceship to be able to deliver people, first cargo, but then people to the other side of the of the Earth at, at a reasonable price. And that is a game changer for the industry in terms of uh, economics. Um, if you look at uh, pre present uh, press enter again, the by estimates uh, of UBS, uh, they made a they made a space tourism or a space travel report. They estimated that at two thousand five hundred dollars per person, uh, if you pay that price to travel to the other side of the Earth, high speed point to point travel will represent around twenty billion dollars per year. But the industry as a whole would be an $800 billion industry for point-to-point high-speed travel. So as you can see, very, very attractive, very big numbers. And that explains to you why these companies are investing so much energy and so much time to do it. Because that is our final, our finality is high-speed travel or orbital high-speed travel, high-speed travel through hypersonics, another possibility, but nevertheless, a lot of appetite for that because the need for travel and for moving people to point A to point B on Earth is very, very high. And it obviously has an attractive marketplace in terms of uh, potential market. So enter, please. How do, we, how do we develop the space economy? Well, you need a lot of things to do that. And you need a lot of smart people, quite a bit of money, uh, a lot of innovation to get there. And you also need a lot of different testing platforms to be able to test your payloads, uh, test uh, the different components and so forth to develop the industry. So if you press enter, there are training platforms and testing regimes and things that need to be, need to do to develop. You can press enter again. Basically, for all the value chain that we have from designing rockets that need to be reusable uh, some of these will be retrieved with a helicopter. Some of these will be retrieved by landing down and so forth. But you need to test all these things and you need to test the different components and so forth. Satellite operators by themselves, as I mentioned before, especially all the LEO satellite operators today, they're, they're, they're putting a lot of new things that we didn't put in to these uh, small payloads and the small satellites in the industry in the past. Uh, and by virtue of that, you need to do a lot of component testing before you launch these into space if you don't want to have uh, the same kind of, uh, if, you want to, if you want to have some reliability of your components. So you need systems and payloads and platforms to be able to develop, develop these and simulate, uh, simulate zero gravity environments, also do testing of vibrations and a whole bunch of other things that you need to do. On the component manufacturer side, there are so many different sensors and different technologies that are being built now. For example, there's one company, uh, Spire Global, based in Luxembourg, that uh, has a small uh, 3U satellite network of about 100 that are flying today that are providing some very amazing services. They're providing weather services where they can see through clouds, through GPS uh, occultation. They're providing uh, ship tracking uh, services where ships go dark and they turn the lights off and then they continue tracking it with, with, uh, with, with, with their satellites. 
Uh, they're also providing tracking for aircraft. Uh, you know, we've seen accidents in the last few years where aircraft simply disappeared and we didn't know where they went. Well, they also have an, what's called an AIS service, which tracks aircraft. So, but what they're doing here is in the payload space, they are, they are compressing the payloads of their existing services and they're making a little bit of extra space for new payloads, new sensors for other customers. So they can, as they keep launching these small satellites that, you know, they have to keep launching, launching because they come, come in, they're on low, uh, extreme low, low Earth, Earth, Earth orbit. So they don't, they don't stay in space very, very long. So they have to keep launching new generations. So since they're doing that, they're allowing a little extra space and a little extra power on their satellites to host other technology providers to test other kinds of services. So it's an exciting time because it leaves space for innovation. It's a little bit like the ride share from SpaceX by having a ride share. You can uh, uh, provide uh, uh, cargo at, at a very, very low cost per kilogram to people that would ride along with your SpaceX satellites. Well, here they're doing the same thing by allowing other companies to put their payloads along with the small satellites they will launch anyway, right? So you can test your technology and you can validate it. So very, very exciting services coming up in the next few years uh, through these small satellites. Also, you have, we mentioned earlier, 3D printing technologies, you have transfer of fluids, you have all these different things that need to happen, uh, developing crystals, uh, fiber optic, uh, better fiber, fiber optic uh, um, uh, materials, uh, and, the, and the pharma industry, of course, is huge, uh, and there's certain, certain kinds of uh, uh, elements and basic components that you can build in space that perhaps you can't build here on Earth to develop certain types of technologies for, for, for the pharmaceuticals. Uh, and there's a lot of emphasis for pharma in space as well. And last but not least, you have the astronaut training part, which of course, uh, as we see uh, more and more people willing to travel to space to take uh, these high-speed vehicles, uh, there will be that component of training that has, needs to happen, right? So not everybody wants to say, oh, I'm, 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 I'm an astronaut. From tomorrow, I will be an astronaut and I will fly in a rocket. It's not that simple. We need some training and we need some some systems and some processes and so forth. So this whole area here needs development. And some companies are developing uh, some very good platforms to 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 provide these kind of services for training. Uh, and that's I'd like to close this this part of my uh, you know short conversation with you to speak about a new venture that I just uh, uh, that, that we we founded. It's still in stealth. You can press enter. And that venture is called Zero G Launch. Now, Zero G Launch is, is, a, is a company that provides a platform for testing and validation of different technologies to go to space. But we're in stealth mode today, so we're not we haven't opened up uh, to to the world on what we're doing, uh, and we will hopefully be in the marketplace in the in the next uh, few years, uh, a bit more open, showing what we do for the space industry. But with this, I'd like to just leave it leave it for, for some questions. Uh, I, I know that I can go on for hours and hours with this kind of a subject. Whenever you talk to me about space, uh, you grab me on one subject, I can go on for three or four hours so I can wear your ear out, as, as we say in the United States. But in, in any case, thank you for the opportunity to talk to, to the group. I hope that something of what I spoke today resonates and, uh, and gives you some ideas on some of the things that are happening in space. And... Uh, I open this to questions from from the group and the participants uh, who'd like to uh, to ask anything of me at this point. Anything that maybe that we talked about, if you'd like to. Thank you so much, Robert. That was a really interesting talk. It sounds like a very exciting industry to be in. We have um, a couple questions um, from people, which I'll give you the first one now. Um, so. Trisla asks, when do you think this travel market will be truly profitable, especially since some commercial airlines are going to be carbon neutral? Yeah, I, I think I think that's uh, obviously uh, going carbon neutral is very important because there is that element of where our earth warming up and air, air, with as many air, airliners that get produced every year and as many that fly that are already produced that are part of the airline industry, there's quite a bit of pollution goes up into our atmosphere. We all agree that that's an, it's an issue. Um, going carbon neutral is, is something of the future that is very, very real. Uh, and it's a, it's a strong prerogative for, for the industry. Obviously with rockets, it's a bit dif more difficult because um, it's, it's, a, it's something that you, you need to have 
the propulsion systems that are adequate to be able to um, to bring you up to 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 escape Earth's uh, gravity uh, with tremendous uh, uh, power, and not all that is feasible through carbon neutral technologies. But having said that, there are a few technologies, a few companies that are experimenting with different types of propulsion, greener propulsion, not not so uh, uh, I guess uh, harmful to our to our ozone or to our uh, environment, uh, and those are going to be doing some good things. There's a one company, for example, using uh, water propulsion, uh, some some uh, hybrid of water propulsion to try to do this. But again, you have to be able to have enough thrust to take very very heavy, you know, hundred hundred plus ton vehicles out to space, and that's uh, that's not a not an easy thing to do with uh, with uh, today's green technology, let's say. But the industry knows it. The industry is following that, and we're definitely very, very, very conscious of that. One of the things, that, for example, that I think it's Arion that we spoke about. Uh, they uh, they did a deal uh, about I want to say one and a half, two months ago. They announced it, where they are going green by buying carbon uh, uh, by by using uh, carbon credits from a company in Canada in Vancouver called uh, um, uh, Carbon Engineering. And Carbon Engineering extracts basically uh, pollution from the, from, the, from, from the atmosphere and creates uh, pellets uh, with that that are basically carbon neutral because you've removed you know, uh, hundreds of, of tons of, uh, of uh, um, pollution and created uh, usable pellets for propulsion. So there's there are things happening that way because the industry knows it has to be greener, no doubt about it. Uh, and there are some companies doing something about it. So I think it's an interesting interesting thing. And by the way, that that company, uh, Carbon Engineering, also signed an agreement with uh, United Airlines to provide them with carbon credits. So you're seeing that happening already. I'm not saying it's here today, but it's happening. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you uh, very much for your talk as well. Uh, we've got another audience question from Chris, um, who firstly thanks you for the insightful talk, and then um, from space traffic and debris to the environmental costs of the large amounts of propellants used in rockets. Could you talk a bit more about the sustainability of the space economy? Uh, what is currently being done and what should be done in the future? Uh, was the question specific uh, again to to environmental impact, or uh, I didn't hear that first part of the question, Matilda? Um, yeah, I think um, it asked about um, yeah the environment and uh, space debris. Oh, okay, okay, okay. got it. Um, yes, um, we talked a little bit about the environmental impact already, and I think uh, it's clear that you know the more. Uh, rockets you launch, the more vehicles are flying, the more stuff will go into the atmosphere. Now, no, we all know it, and we have to be more conscious about that. Let's speak about space debris just a little bit, because that is another very, very, very key area. As you've seen, some of these small satellites uh, that are being launched uh, today, there's many, many more of them than we had in the past, because they're smaller, you can launch them in batches, and they're forming small constellations. And they're already four mega constellations announced uh, that will be collectively launching something in the order of 35 to 40,000 satellites. To give you a perspective, today we have roughly uh, a little under 3,000 working satellites, working satellites that are operational today around orbits, in different orbits. Uh, so when, you, in, when you're adding another 40,000 or so uh, in a space of 10 years, you can imagine that that there's there's a lot more things that you will need to take care of, including the tracks or the orbits you will be flying your constellations in to make sure they don't cross and they don't uh, collide, uh, and make sure that you can manage that properly. If you look at the marketplace today, there's a roughly 58,000 satellites that are approved today, approved with frequencies to launch in the next 10 years. 58,000 satellites. So that creates a huge Huge problem. Now, granted, not all of them will launch, and not all of the companies are. Some of them are startups and so forth, but there's still today FCC and uh, and um, uh, uh, Switzerland approved companies 
that have their frequencies too large. So that's it. That gives you just the size of sort of a size of the problem. Now, let's look at the orbital space debris. Today, we track in the industry roughly 25 plus thousand objects with the technology we have today. Out of those 25,000 objects, I mentioned roughly uh, 3,000 or so are working satellites. Uh, a whole bunch of the rest are big second stage or third stage boosters that just will stay there in orbit forever, pretty much, depending on the altitudes they're in. Uh, there's chips of paint that are coming off these boosters, the white paint, for example, that are traveling at 27,500 miles per hour. Uh, a little chip of paint of two centimeters will destroy a satellite, to give you an idea. There's uh, old rocket boosters that weren't vented properly, meaning they did not expel all the propellant that was in those rockets properly. So that has started leaking. And those propellant pellets become missiles of one or two centimeter round of, crystal, of hard crystals, because they're as hard as rock traveling through space. Again, those can destroy your satellites. So when you start looking at all this, and there are a few collisions between these objects because there are so many of them. To give you an idea of the, the amount of, of these, we are tracking today around 25 to 26,000 with you know, multiple countries who have sensors to track these. We know what they are. We can tell you six days in advance if two objects will have a, a close encounter. And we can tell the operator if they have a satellite encountering an object or something, we can tell an operator six, seven days in advance, you'll need to do something about this, right? Um, so looking at the, the next, and if you look at 10 centimeters or higher, there's about 25,000 objects that we're tracking. If you look at something around one to two centimeters of size, there's an estimated 600,000 objects out there, just bolts and paint chips and a whole bunch of other things that are, that are out there that we are not really tracking today. We don't have the technology. So there are a few companies now that are innovating, some putting some massive radars on the ground and blasting energy to space so you can bounce back signals from very small objects in space and then you need to catalog them and you need to track them as they keep going. The catalog becomes very, very big when you have 600,000 objects. But being able to identify them, catalog them, track them, and then create alerts for potential collisions is a big issue. So that's a really good question. Now, let's go to the one millimeter to one centimeter range. Estimated. 170 million, dollar, 100, 170 million objects flying out there today. Estimated, because we don't know. So this problem will only get worse with more satellites out there. And that's one of the real main reasons why I, myself, and the other people in the industry are absolute proponents of having some sort of regulation uh, in launching vehicles to space. Because if you look at the, uh, I want to say the last year, there were about 1,000 satellites launched. Uh, um, small satellites, CubeSat type of satellites. Uh, and out of those, uh, only 40 of those uh, about a year and a half ago contained any kind of propulsion to be able to go up or down. They're basically space rocks, right? They degenerate and come down back into, into, into uh, our atmosphere. But you can't have that environment where you can just launch things to space and leave them there. You just can't. So at a very, very minimum, the industry here in the States and in Europe as well is really pro a proponent of having two major requirements before you are allowed to launch anything into space. One is that you have propulsion, so you can move out of the way or, 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 or mitigate any kind of uh, close encounter. And number two, that you have a definite plan for disposal of that satellite at end of life. If your end of life is three years or four years, you have to have a plan that is believable that says, I will bring it back and I will... Uh, you know, we will we'll take it out of out of uh, harm's way. So very good question. It's one that it, it's taking a lot of attention from the industry today because it's going to be a huge problem when you put that many more objects into space. You saw the, fi the figures I gave you today. Those are estimates, but they're pretty horrendous uh, figures in terms of the amount of things out there. If you add another 30, 40,000 satellites out there. There, are, there, will, there will be some mishaps. There will be some collisions. There will be some failures of some that you can't manage, you can't uh, uh, command anymore. There will, there will be some issues. And so we have to have some regulation there to be able to manage the whole process. So I hope that sheds some light on that question. <laughs>
Thank you for that. I've got um, another uh, question from the audience. This is, what do you think competition would look like with new Chinese and Indian ventures um, and with links to potential Cold War 2.0? Well, you know, uh, as as a as a techie, I guess, as a as a you know space industry person, um, I, I have a lot of admiration for the amount of technology development that has been happening. Uh, the Russians were very very strong at that in the in the past, and to some extent, they still have some very very cool things happening. But they've kind of fallen behind a little bit. Uh, you know, it's the economy that that has driven that them to 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 kind of lose their place a little bit there. Still a lot of respect for, for the Russian technology though today. I mean, they have workhorses that continue to operate for really, really well. Um, you look at companies or countries like China, uh, relatively new player in this economy. You know, uh, But last year, I believe the number of launches they had last year was uh, 40 or 40 some, maybe. I can't, don't quote me on that per per perfect, but I think it was around 40 launches last year. So really becoming a big player in the launch industry, but they're developed technologies. They have they have the rovers on the moon. Uh, they are so quickly developing a very capable space faring technology that you have to admire the efforts uh, of China because um, they're throwing a lot of money at it. Of course, that helps when the government puts a lot of money towards something. You get a lot of people. Uh, into that, and, and they have the financing to be able to innovate and create uh, create that the technology. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, in terms of relationships and uh, political relationships with China, things are not so easy with some countries in the West. Uh, but you know, I have to say, hats off to technology development, and they're doing it so quickly uh, that I that as as a as a techie space techie, I have to say, wow, right? Now let's go to India. India. Uh, is just amazing to me because they are they they they've become one of the preeminent launch countries in the world. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, where they launched that little probe to Mars for a total of seventy million dollars, seven zero million dollars. The whole the whole campaign was seventy million dollars. That is unheard of in our, in our industry to launch something to Mars for seventy million dollars. It should be in the billions, right? You think, but that was a crazy uh, milestone. I think it was four or five years ago. But India has been becoming a very, very strong uh, um, country in launch. Uh, they have their strong domestic program that uh, with that with, with the launch vehicles for launching their own satellites and indigenous satellites and international satellites, by the way. Uh, and then they have the small launch vehicle, the PSLV, which uh, has been launching uh, ride shares now for many, many years before anybody. Uh, ha have been doing it. They already have been launching, you know, 30, 40, 50 satellites at a time. So they really have given an impulse to the industry to be able to have low cost access to space. And they are a low cost access to space, but a very high, very highly reliable access to space. And now the country is opening that further now to saying, okay, let's use the American model, India saying, let's put the Israel Space Agency, Israel, to open up and do some technology transfer to private companies, a little bit like NASA has done with SpaceX, NASA has done with with Blue Origin and a few others, to it, to allow them to quickly use our tools, our services, our to our things that we've learned, to innovate themselves and create their own private companies, and that is a wonderful thing to see because that is an overt action from the government saying we want to help private commercial space to thrive in India, and. Again, hats off to that because a few very good companies that are startups that are now trying uh, getting to where they want to be uh, with the assistance of Israel is a wonderful thing. And I think those uh, public-private partnerships are very helpful, especially when you have a, a government uh, customer that allows you to use all these very, very expensive tools to develop your technology. So, yeah, as you can tell, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm obviously very, I have a lot of admiration for those countries that are doing some great things in space, the political side is a different thing, but you know it's just part of reality, unfortunately, today, right? Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, we have 
uh, one uh, question, another question from the audience, um, who asks approximately what is the uh, different uh, parts of um, funding that comes from public funding uh, versus private funding in space sector? Yeah, I spoke a little bit about what happens in the U.S., for example, the model in the U.S. is, uh, and I think Europe is, is somewhat following the same model now, too, uh, is, uh, you know, allow companies to use certain things that you've developed to not have to, re you know, invent everything from scratch, right? Uh, some companies, uh, I'm not going to name them, but some companies uh, that have had these uh, Space Act agreements, it's called, uh, with NASA, for example, uh, have been able to use their technology for the re-entry tiles, for example. NASA has done a lot of work on space shuttles and other vehicles on different types of polymers, different types of of, uh, of compounds to to develop uh, heat shields and re-entry uh, type of vehicles. So a lot of experience there. They make that information available to industry, which is really, really, really great. Because then you can say, well, you know, they've done this and that may be the right way they did it, but I think I could do this better because based on what they did, I think I might be able to do that this way with some changes and so forth. So those partnerships are really important because they allow you to shorten the time to, 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 to your technological development in terms of your operational capabilities, right? And, and this goes to a lot of things. Uh, uh, you know, they allow you to, to access a, a throve of information from you know, systems from attaching, you know, payloads to other payloads, release systems, power technics, uh, uh, pneumatic separation of, of stages and things like that, that they've learned a lot about. They've done a lot of different things. So Europe is, I think, now trying to get into that same model too. Uh, you know about the 100 million euro development fund from uh, from NISA, that they're they're wanting to do that too. They want to be able to to innovate and to allow other companies to innovate, not just being led by you know the government to to uh, have expensive programs, but to allow a lot of that experience to translate and transfer onto the commercial side of the business. And that's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing because that's gonna that's gonna create more competition, more innovation, and quicker access to space and technologies. Right. Uh, thank you. I think we're running out of time now, but I'd just like to ask one more question, which is um, what advice would you give to a recent graduate who wants to work in the space economy? Yeah, uh, well, I guess one of the one of the things that I would really, really emphasize is that you don't have to be to be an aerospace engineer to be in the space industry. Uh, there's so much happening today in space that involves um, not only the technology, uh, but involves software, that involves communication issues, that involves uh, medicine, it involves so many different things that you don't have to be uh, an astronaut or a space industry, you know, or, 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 or a former fighter, fighter pilot or so forth to be to be in the space industry. I've used this example before, uh, but. There's one company, and again, I can't name it, but there was one company where I was really surprised to see that one of the employees was a school teacher. I said, a school teacher? Well, the proposals sent to clients have to be beautifully written, and they have to be well written and uh, with good diction, punctuation, separation, and uh, paragraphing, and so forth and so on, and presentation, so that the company was viewed to be very professional, right? So that space company employee was a school teacher. And that school teacher looked at the offers that were submitted to clients to make sure they were professional, well-written, and so forth. So to tell you, you don't have to be an aerospace engineer to be in the space industry. You can be a school teacher and you can still be in the space industry. So that's my sort of uh, takeaway for you guys, because if you have the, the imagination and the purpose in you, to do something in space. You can find your place, your niche in, in space by doing anything you are doing today, but just apply it to the space industry. So I think uh, uh, the, the space economy is open to, to people like yourselves that have the drive and the imagination to make it happen. Thank you very much for this talk. I think unfortunately that's 
all the time we had for today, but it was really interesting to have you today and to talk to you. So thank you for your time. It was my pleasure. And I all the best to the to the Warwick Space Industry uh, uh, group, and uh, all the best to you guys out there in Europe. And I'll sign off and uh, continue with my day here. So all the best, Avida Zain, à la prochaine. <laughs>